it is this. It is this. Oh yeah, I'm putting these bad boys on. It is the. Uh, oh yeah. Check mic one two. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Oh baby, I can hear you. Uh oh. Uh oh. Hey yo. This feels like uh, a. <laughs> it feels like old time. <laughs> it it does sound like. Are we recording? We are recording. <laughs> That's right. Right now. If live like, and in color. If feel, oh yes. So um, um, DeAndre <laughs> wasn't. Um, he wasn't referring to in color being that. You know. Careful. Our, okay. Uh, he what he's referring to <laughs> was that we have we're we're. we're <laughs> That we are recording today. I don't know if that's going to make the podcast. That we're recording today, uh, and uh, not just recording, but filming our podcast filming. today. Yes. So, um, did you put makeup on? Tons, tons. Each morning, yeah. I put a little manscara on. <laughs> <laughs> like that. My dad jokes are are um, in full form. Full form. Well, not yet. But they ladies will. and gentlemen, by the time you listen to this, probably actually, yeah, uh, Michael Jarbo may be a brand new dad. Dang man, crazy, crazy, shocking. This is what the world is coming to. I know. Hide your, hide your kids, hide your wives. Uh, <laughs> baby Jarbo <laughs> is making his way into the world. Um, we re- realize um, that the background here for our film is not pretty, but give us time. Give us time. My big project during, I hear I can do a lot of projects during paternity leave. I'm going to get some decor, an interior designer to kind of work on this. Those guys over at Chapelwood, they oh got Michael. all sorts of beautiful, no, am I wrong? You'll, you'll, lots of projects. Can, I do, sure. can I do lots of projects? I will be amazed. Why are you laughing right uh, now? I am, I'm bemused. <laughs> bemused. <laughs> I'm gonna. I'm really gonna fall apart. Uh, it's gonna be great. I'm sure it will be great. Um, it will be. I'm so excited. Um, so this is yeah, last podcast before paternity leave, and then we'll return, uh, hopefully in in December again. But uh, grateful to be back online with you. Yeah, man. I would, might as well just acknowledge that we. Yes, it's been a long time since a recent podcast, but we filmed a podcast with the Reverend Matt Rawl. We did. Do you want to share your? Um, so what had happened was. <laughs> What had happened was, is we had some technical difficulties. We did, and we, and we yeah. don't normally, but... That's right, that's right. We we started recording, and somewhere along the way, the thing shut off. Yeah. Um, and unfortunately, that was close to the end of our conversation, uh, where we were able to restart it, but we didn't capture all of the things. So. And let me tell you what. You all, you all missed out on some incredible... Incredible Wisdom. Wisdom. <laughs> And a lot of stupidity. Well, there's that. There's that too. Yeah. But uh, we'll have to get Matt Raw on one more time. We definitely down, down the down the road. Definitely because he was. It was a great conversation. I, I wish we had it, but yeah. Sorry about that, friends. But if, we're if you are longing for more Matt Raw in your life, come check on out his podcast in the Sandbox uh, with Rachel Billups. Ooh, yeah. Thank you. Shout out Rachel Billups. Shout out. Shout out Sandbox. Yes. Yeah. By the way, Michael, uh-huh. who are you? Who am I? I'm John Valjean. Oh boy! <laughs> uh, we didn't start how we normally start. Oh yeah, thank you so much. Gosh, it's just been so long. The cobwebs have have grown. Uh, I'm Michael Jarbo. I'm DeAndre Johnson, and welcome to Work It Out. Come on, we are here th- today, as we always are, to go over a couple articles, some podcasts, reflecting on working out our faith in the midst of uh, today's um, engagement with the world. And uh, I'm grateful that we've got some good articles. Uh, so first up, we always start off with top of the news. Top, 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 top of the news. Mm. That's for you, Michael. Smooth, creamy jazz. <laughs> <laughs> that, uh, and that was beautiful. I've been known to be called uh, uh, having the voice of a golden honeybee. I think that needs more time to unpack. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Just oh no, there's a technical difficulty. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Hashtag uh, Matt Roll. <laughs> is that what he calls you? Well, uh, the you voice know, of a golden honeybee? You know. I wouldn't disagree. I'm just shocked that you put that on <laughs> for all of our listeners. So Somebody was going to say it, so I, I went ahead. Okay, okay, okay. There you go. All right. So this first article is uh, from the Dallas Morning News. came out uh, not too long ago. It's called Hope in the Vir- is the Virtue that Makes the Political Life Possible. Mm-hmm. Uh, engaging- Who wrote it, Michael? Well, that's that's the exciting part. The author of this article for the Dallas Morning News, Hope is a Virtue That Makes the Political Life Possible, is the one and only Dr. Dallas Jingles, Jingles. Uh, who is uh, both my advisor for my doctorate there at Perkins School of Theology at SMU, 
Pony Up, and also was um, early um, one of the first voices on the podcast. That's besides right. Ours. That's right. So yeah. shout out Dallas. We have a big following of Dallas Jingles uh, fans. Mm-hmm. They're called Janglers. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so to all the janglers out there, shout out. Glad you're glad we're uh, giving, <laughs> he's going to kill me. Um, you got jar bites and you got janglers. Come so, on. I love it. So this article is, well, first off, fantastic. Great writing. Um, and you can find it on the Dallas Morning News. Dallas archives. always, always, always makes me feel a little bit dumber and smarter at the same time. Yes, that is well said. <laughs> dumber and smarter. I love that. Uh, I'm both intimidated and enamored. That's right, uh, yes. <laughs> I'm crying and I'm laughing. Uh, all the emotions. What did you, what was it maybe a standout piece about this? I mean, this is talking about the importance of cultivating, building institutions and how in the midst of political strife and the world that we live in, which is a political infused world, one of the reasons we were talking about this is we're days away from the upcoming election. Early voting in Texas here starts next Monday. There's a lot of strife in the air about right. this, both right. in the, in the, around the church, in their neighborhoods. So what sort of, I mean, for lack of a better term, hope do you find from this <laughs> article, DeAndre? What sticks out to you? I mean, the the heart of what sticks out to me is... Uh, Dallas pulls out of uh, using a, a very um, contextual story from uh, post World War One Germany. Um, he pulls out really the anatomy of hope uh, mm-hmm. that that hope is born out of a refusal to see things only in one way, uh, right? In order to to get to possibility, and that and that possibility happens by one uh, through disillusionment in what is yeah uh especially when what is tends to lead us uh, when we when we only think about the problems that we face or the darkness that we're in or the evils that we encounter when we only focus in on that as the problem looking for a solution then we um we tend actually to just mire ourselves in miserableness, right? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but instead, um, that in being disillusioned about is the about the question of are the evils really that bad? Oh, right. Being disillusioned by that actually leads to a, a kind of hope, right. and he gives this wonderful story about Max Weber. Yeah. In Germany, who is invited to give this lecture to these students who are uh, super gung ho about what it what it means to um, uh, aspire to their political leanings, and <laughs> uh, he's reluctant to do it. But what he does is he instead of giving in to uh, their sense of uh, the way the world is, etc., he instead uh, what he says is Weber's gift to them was instead disillusionment to begin to distrust the sense that the evils, the problems, the issues we're facing, the challenges, the difficulties, that all those things are the only things that are existent right now. Oh, man. Right. That uh, that instead, what is what is also present while there are things that we need to do, but what's also present is the possibility of hope. Yeah. Yeah. You know, um, are you sure you didn't? Are you sure Max Weber didn't? Um teach the class last week i mean right <laughs> hey, right is that not a trend absolutely you still see um I, I love this line where he says but right here right in the middle of evil um uh, uh and misery uh, and he begins also talking about augustine uh in this article are, are locates the odd virtue of hope mm-hmm. and he talks about uh the hope of a world to come and the hope of salvation and like the importance of virtues in our life and how we utilize the virtues that come from building an institution so building an institution i mean just the idea like what is an institution to you you know we we, I th- we think about it as the church we think about it i mean the boy scouts of america is an yeah. institution you can think about girl scouts you can think about your local country club you can think about your lions club the institutionality of it sometimes can seem in our world just kind of old school and you know i even had a, a, a person not long ago like why do i need to be a member of a church yeah yeah yeah. and right that membership you know it's not a country club it's not lakeside or west side or whatever country club we have around here that you know you get all these perks membership also at its core means finding your identity 
mutually with others yeah. and finding the sake of your identity um, to flourish because everyone else is sharing similar identity yeah. and moving forward because yeah. of it. I mean, it's finding it's finding a sense of belonging to a common life amongst others, right? Oh, talks about uh, like, yeah. like uh, you know, some people, especially today, may get hung up on the term institutions and all the baggage <laughs> oh. that institutions and institutionality may carry with it. But really what we're boiling down to and what, what uh, uh, Dr. Dow- Dallas Jingles <laughs> is getting into here as well is that hope is born when we start st- Uh, stop focusing so much on me and mine and more on us and we right and it's built it's the building of those institutions that then make up our common life where we begin to really think about what what is for the common good Mm. how do we work towards the common good how do we live out of the common good and preserve the common good that that's where hope is born and hope flourishes and you might argue, and I kind of am in my own dissertation, <laughs> is that the church <laughs> yeah. is the place where that common life can most be found. That's right. Where hope can flourish if we can, for just a moment, set down or learn to learn a practice of setting down the me mm-hmm. and looking to the we and, and finding absolutely. it. And listen, our political system is set up with no other option but division. Right. You know, everyone's like, well, maybe not everyone, but I've heard people one day, will there ever be three parties really at play? I don't know, (laughs) but forever it's two. And there's some clear lines in the sand and the sand of living in that middle land doesn't feel like it exists so much in our culture. You got to be one way or the other. And this idea of institutions puts aside the need to cling to one or the other and say, there's a better whole, sure. a, a whole W H O L E that exists beyond the sort of um, landscape that we place. Yeah, yeah. You know, I, I would add a little nuance to that, but only to say that um, I don't think what's inherent in our, particularly our uh, two party system here in America, I don't think it necessitates that kind of division. Uh, but when uh, we participated, participate in it uh, unintentionally and unwittingly, uh, that is that that we don't bring an intentional critical lens to how we are participating in it, then we can tend towards the extremes of that two-party divide. And in those extremes, it is, here are the problems I see and they're the only things I see, yeah. right? And so the only fix I have is for everybody and everything to look like me. Mm. To, to be like me, well, to do it like I do it or like I want it. And that leads us into this, um, uh, at times, a nostalgia for a past that never was yeah, or a um, idealistic future uh, or hope for a future that uh, is, will never really exist, right? But somewhere in the middle is where real hope is is born and our common life actually meets uh, meets us. One of the things that he talks about in here, and I love this, he talks about these two tendencies that end up happening in our two-party system where you have a nostalgic uh, for a world that has passed or that never existed and a despairing of the world we have been given. Right. That these two tendencies, this illusion on one hand, despair on the other, are enemies of hope. Despair tells us that the darkness is the only real thing and that we shouldn't believe that the morning will come. And illusion tells us that the darkness isn't actually real. Hope tells us to build institutions of light in the midst of that darkness, Mm. places where we meet together, where we uh, are able to explore possibilities alongside naming, here's some real issues that Mm. we've got to deal with. So in... In all that you just said, and in reading the uh, the article and and Doctor Dallas Jingles' words, I, uh, I I'm thinking about um, school nurse when I was a child, um, and not feeling good around midday, giving me um, you know like putting this special blanket that she had on mm. over me uh, that apparently had superpowers. When I was elementary school, by the way, not high school, elementary school, right? And I think giving me just a little. Uh, 
parent approved Tylenol and um, and kind of sending me on my way. With the, I say all that to say we are days, hours away from election times sure. and for church people listening to this um we we are moving into this you know very heightened season and then there will like there will be a result that comes and what that means has very different outcomes mm-hmm. for you what's the what's the blanket that we can put on right now we're not feeling too good maybe we're a little stressed by all the the scam the uh, scam the, the uh, you well the scam uh you know phone calls and the and the blanket messages and the our in, our inboxes and our bot mailboxes are so full of stuff and things and propaganda i feel tired i feel a little under the weather what would be a helpful blanket for people of faith yeah that we could hold on to that maybe you took from Dallas's words dr uh, jingles words yeah <laughs> yeah well i think i think the the helpful blanket is what we what many of us learned in elementary school as well, which is he's got the whole world in his hands. Come on now. Right. And if he's got the whole world in his hands, what makes me think this election will rock the world out of his hands? Wow. Right. OK. So. So, yeah. <laughs> Take it there. Yes. No, no, no matter what happens, no matter what the outcome is, he's got the whole world in his hands. And so the outcome, any outcome can lead to goodness. And I think that hope is something that we can put our trust in. That's right. That he's got the whole world in his hands. And if we are not people of faith, excuse me, if we are people of faith, do we not believe? Yeah. Do we not trust that? Right. Right. Hmm. What is it? Psalm 35 says a a horse is a, a, a vein. Uh, a vain hope to put put your trust in, right? Uh, <laughs> oh, it's it's talking about military power. Sure. It's like princes are a vain hope to put your trust. Put your trust in God. Come on. Um, and so, the building of institutions. Uh, and, and this is part of what Doctor Jingles gets at, and uh, and certainly what uh, what I know you're including your dis- dissertation uh, forthcoming. Um, you'll be on the lookout for this oh, yeah. book written by Doctor Michael Jarbo uh, soon. Yeah. There you go. Uh, <laughs> but um, it is that the church is is that kind of institution where hope is not only born, but also experienced and lived out. Oh, yeah. Through the old, old story. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, it's woven in. That's this right. hope is woven in. Yeah. Are we paying attention or are we um, too distracted? Mm-hmm. Um, might we trust that? He's got the whole world in his hands. Yeah. Man, that's a good, yeah. Blanket, little Tylenol. We got this, friends. We got Praying this. for each of you in this season, because I know you're w- worn out if you're like us. Mm-hmm. But we have that trust. Um, he's got the whole world. All the right. The good news is the election will be over soon. Praise God. <laughs> <laughs> Man, yes. All right. So next up is the pop moment. Pop, 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 Moment. <laughs> when will it end? <laughs> when will it end, Lord? Psalm 45. When will it end, Lord? <laughs> how, how long, oh Lord? <laughs> how long, oh Lord, will you forget me? <laughs> that was going it. all through DeAndre's mind as I went. I just quit. like I was like, I'm going to wrap this up somehow. And it just, it kind of kept going. Well, I, was, I was partly curious. Like, how, <laughs> how, how much higher is he going to go? <laughs> Oh, God, just so (laughs) dumb. All right. The pop moment for today is Malcolm Gladwell's coming out with a new book. We both love Malcolm Gladwell. Yeah. Came out with a tipping point years ago that kind of got him on the on the radar. And at the same time, we love a guy named Kerry Newhoff, who is a former senior pastor, but really a church leadership guru, has a podcast. We've quoted him. We've talked about him actually on the podcast before. Uh, we, we both kind of nerd out about him. And the two of them came together for his podcast not long ago. And DeAndre was on a, a, a beautiful trip out into the uh, God's God's country, right? Where'd you go for Big Fall Ben? Break? Big Ben. How yeah. was it? It was awesome, man. Yeah. Who knew there were mountains in Texas? I mean, God. <laughs> It's got it all. Yeah, yeah. 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 Beautiful night skies. Oh, I uh, bet. You know, just, it was us awesome. A little crisp at night, maybe? Yeah. A little chilly. Yeah, yeah. I love that. 
Absolutely. Yeah. Crisp Texas night is good. And so talk to me about, uh, we, we both listened to the podcast. What, what was a little standout for you on, um, on Malcolm Gladwell's podcast, the, the title here, it's it's episode 682, if you're looking for it, on the Carrie Newhoff Leadership mm-hmm. Podcast. It says, Malcolm Gladwell deconstructs his writing process and habits, shares his theory on how to reach people in a crowded world, and explains the revenge of the tipping point. Yeah, so Revenge of the Tipping Point is the title of his new book. And, yep. uh, I'm interested to read it. I haven't read it yet, yep. so but I'm interested in doing that. Uh, what really struck me was really the conversation around how to reach people in a crowded world. Yep. Um, and part of it was uh, just this little snippet of their conversation where uh, I believe it was Carrie Newhoff who um, introduced the idea of, you know, we keep hearing that people have short, uh, shortened attention spans mm-hmm. now. And my, Malcolm kind of pushed back on that, and he said, you know, for the longest, this is this is a quote of what he said from the podcast here. He says, you know, for the longest people have said our attention spans are getting shorter, but I don't buy that. He says, I think what's happening is that things that can be shortened have been shortened. Mm. And I think what's maybe a better way of saying that, it's not that our attention spans have gotten shorter, it's that maybe the bar has been raised a little. That we will devote attention to something that compels us, that moves us, and that has meaning. And he gives Mm. this wonderful example about how uh, he's a huge basketball fan. Yep. But he's moved um, uh, and he's discovered that he doesn't have to watch every game. Yeah. To prove that he's a fan. It's like 82 games or something a year. Right, right. a lot of games. Instead, what he does, he watches the highlights on ESPN, SportsCenter or something. Uh, And then he watches the the critical games that happen close to playoffs. That's right. right? And, And that's how he engages the sport and he is no less a fan by doing that right. than if he were to watch every game moving forward right but then he gives the other example so he talks about that as a way in which some things have been shortened yep. um, that doesn't have as much to do with attention span as much as a prioritization of what's really needed in this moment for me uh, to engage this thing right mm. but then he gives this other example of how he watched this uh this new series on Apple TV. Oh, yeah. <laughs> this new series that he both found somewhat compelling and then somewhat annoying. Yeah. And yet he watched all eight eight episodes. Oh, yeah. Each an hour long. Oh, yeah. He said, I devoted eight hours of my life. And he said, I don't got eight hours. That's, that's exactly right. <laughs> right? Yeah. But, but part of what he gets to is how we... Uh, we unintentionally, I say unintentional, meaning that we don't always think through what we're doing when we're doing it, Man. right? Um, but how we will prioritize certain things and and, and not prioritize other things. Uh, and oftentimes we find ourselves in a, a conflict of values yeah. based on not really thinking through what are we really prioritizing here? Yeah. Oh, man. So I watched that show. Um, the name of it is slipping my mind. Uh, why I watched the show is I have a um, a lovely wife. Uh, uh, shout out Leslie, who's 37 weeks pregnant and uh, doesn't have much she can do in the evenings in the in the, her uh, later months of pregnancy. So a lot of sitting and hanging around. Likewise, she is a fan of. Uh, pop culture mm-hmm. and pop, 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 uh, pop culture. And uh, and she's a hairstylist. And so um, I used to think it was a, a ploy for her to get to watch whatever she wanted. So she's like, <laughs> I got to know what to talk about with my people who come in my chair. But and I was like, you're just getting out, you know, so I can't watch the football <laughs> game. So you watch Real Housewives of whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, and, and now we have more than one TV, so everything's fine. But all that he said is like she does. It's helpful for her job to be in the know about. Some of these shows. And so one of the reasons we spent eight hours watching this show, which, you know, your boy uh, sitting <laughs> still for an hour is tough. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I've never been a show binger. Sure. Uh, that, like I've got friends, my brother and his wife, they can watch The Office a full season in uh, a weekend and <sighs> just chill and just watch. And it's just like, whoa, yeah, I can't sit that long. Yeah. But I think part of it was the hype. Oh, sure. Around the show yeah. that you have got to see this. Yeah. It's incredible. Or, and, But who's saying it's incredible? I don't Someone, someone that Leslie follows on Instagram or yeah. TikTok that tells her it's incredible and it's got these stars and this person's... But at the same, and so, like, 
that's it. Yeah. That's all we need. Right, right. To take eight hours of our life. Hmm. Well, and that brings up a great point in that, uh, yes, people care about and will devote attention to stories that are compelling, that have meaning, yeah. that uh, grip you, et cetera. But at the same time, we can so easily get caught up in stories that we don't need to be caught up in. Oh, right. Gosh. And so then it becomes this like this uh, in- intense need for us to be really discerning about what stories are we paying attention to. Yeah. Right. So, um, yes, it's incumbent upon maybe, uh, you know, the church and and others right, to tell great stories. Oh, absolutely. In order to draw people in. I mean, that's part of why I carry new office talking to Malcolm Gladwell about this is so that preachers can better understand that, hey, tell a great story. Tell a great story. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Uh, Or tell the old, old story in a compelling way. That's right. But nevertheless, for the individual faith life, part of what it means is what story am I paying attention to? Come on. And I mean, we've already talked a little bit about, you know, in this election cycle and in uh, the political kind of frayedness that we experience mm-hmm. in our country. Part of it is because we have competing stories out there that are both compelling. Oh, well said. Yes. You know, and and depending on what story you're listening to, then one pulls you one direction, the other pulls you the other direction. Um, and part of what is needed is for us to be very mindful about the stories yeah. that are told to us and the ones that we are buying yes. and really discern, are these the kind of stories that lead towards deeper love of God and love of neighbor? Yeah. Um, one thing that comes to mind is Hurricane Burl came, of course, to Houston. But there was a long time it was set to go to Corpus Christi. Yeah. And I, it, it came right after July 4th. Um, and so I, I'm, I'm being mindful of this this kind of moment that's just kind of like light bulb for me. It's so fascinating. The uh, we, uh, we went down to... Um, we went down to the beach for f- July 4th and then we were going through and my mom lives not far away mm. uh, and uh, uh, in, in, um, in Padre Island and we just drove over to Padre Island and we had lunch with her and her and her husband. We're sitting there at this restaurant and you've got uh, Fox News on the TV, on all the TVs in that uh, in this restaurant. And it's telling the story of Hurricane Burl heading to Corpus Christi, but it's done in eight different ways hmm. by means of like uh, a pretty blonde speaking from a desk about this coming, a guy in uh, the the waters of Corpus Christi with his ankle deep, like the waters are warm, then goes to a scientist who is saying the hurricane's coming this way, then to the, the main dude on the weather channel saying, I can't believe it's going to be a storm unlike any other. And then you, you got all, they're all telling the, the same, same story. story from different mediums, but your mind begins to think, I'm getting all of these different perspectives, but it's all the same. Yeah. It's the same story told really well, mm-hmm. very in various different ways. Or sometimes like, again, I didn't need to spend an hour l- learning about the heat of the water at the, but <laughs> people are desperate for that well, sort sure. of compelling. Oh, because the water is so warm, the storm's going to be, it's just, yeah. you could do a rabbit hole. And that's just one little tidbit of, think about from the the biggest from from israel and gaza to uh, russia and ukraine to our current election coming up to i mean big topics yeah Um, yeah well and you know lest we start thinking that um the challenges that we experience are uh new to us right right Uh, this this is a story a as old as time (laughs) right i mean um People have always been motivated and moved by compelling stories. That's right. Um, And when it comes to our own faith narrative and the way we engage faith, it is centered around story and storytelling. Yes. You, You can't understand who God is, you can't follow Jesus, you, you you can't engage the move of the Spirit without engaging the story. Like the story is the compelling thing and faith is transmitted by the telling of the story. Yes, exactly. Right? So um, uh, all that to say is, is that uh, part of what Gladwell picks up on that Kerry Newhoff is uh, teasing out, um, I think is in part that 
the power of story yep. uh, as one, as a driver for, for how we engage our faith. If, if, you want, if you want to go deeper in faith, if you want more faith, uh, if you want stronger faith, engage the story. Engage the story. Right? Tell the story. Yep. Uh, in the telling and retelling of the story, that's when things begin to really deepen and to grip you as the storyteller as well as those who are listening. Right. Um, but then also for us to be mindful about how other stories are being told uh, all around us. Yes. And how we're engaging those stories as well. Right. Yeah. I think the, the route I want to go with you here to wrap up this part is a little bit about um, we had the as, as I'm about to move to paternity leave. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're, we're about to go into. um November and then boom, Advent. Yeah. And we talked a little bit the, uh, earlier today with our friend Jennifer Grow. Um, I'm going to use her in this example and I'll, I'll Venmo her something after using this uh, her name in this <laughs> podcast. But like I, I found a very interesting moment here. I'm going to let people in a little bit. We were just kind of talking about Christmas Eve and um, navigating whether we should do in at the Journey or one of our, our, our large service on the West Campus, if we should do um, – the logistics of intinction, uh, a, a form of communion where you dip the bread into the cup rather than the prepackage that we do normally right. for Christmas. Time-wise, easy, L- less chance for uh, mess, less chance for – and yet there is a beauty in the intinction that people move to the table. They get up and go there. So, okay, so that's a little background. And it was interesting to hear Jennifer Grow. And I was watching the wheels moving in your mind say, <laughs> you know, why do people come for Christmas Eve? I think more than anything, this is her speaking, more than anything, they're, they're, they're less there for communion and more there for the sermon and the songs. And so why would we adjust the whole service to have communion uh, take up so much time? And, and it just, it, I'm getting to my question. My question for you is, DeAndre, um, both are stories. Yeah. The table is a story. The Christmas is a, uh, the, the Christmas telling the story, of the birth of Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us. I, and we, we get thousands of people to come. Yeah. To hear the same thing. Over and, and over, over again. and over again, you could easily YouTube it from home. Yeah, and you could get whoever you think is the best preacher in the galaxy to tell that story, and then make your dinner reservations. Mm-hmm. What do you think it is? This is my question. What do you? Yeah. What grabs what, people? What grabs people's attention for a story as old as this one? Hmm. Hmm. You know, I. I, I don't think, think there's a right answer. I just want to no. hear your answer. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think part of it is that the the story is so compelling because uh, it holds so much mystery. Dude, you went with mystery. Well, how I mean, dare you? <laughs> how dare you bring mystery into this? No, you're good. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Well, uh, so I'll bring I'll bring in just a little bit of of a different part of the the same podcast here with Malcolm Gladwell. Where he talks about, he tells his story about how his dad, one of his favorite things about his dad growing up was that his dad would, um, when they were traveling somewhere or whatnot, his dad would just say, you know what, I'm going to follow my nose. Um, and they would, they would literally like get lost in quotation marks, but there was a sense that we are never lost, right? Like. Yep. Like, we're just going to explore. Oh. And I don't know exactly where we're going to go. I don't know exactly where we're going to end up or whatnot, but we're just going to explore. Yeah. And I think that's part of the Christmas story in general oh, that's good. that we get from the Gospels is that there's so much mystery around it, both in terms of um, the the specificity of some details and then the ambiguity of other details, the... Um, the the characters themselves in the story, as well as the import that has been layered upon the story over the years, um, theologically and culturally, right? That all of those things provide these avenues for people to just get lost, uh, to follow your nose a little bit. And, and that is compelling to people. That's right. Yeah. Oh, dude, that's a great answer. Um, for timing, I won't go my next question, but that is... <laughs> 
That's so good. <laughs> and and it is. It's it's what is DeAndre going to say this year about the great story? Yeah. What's Jarbo going to say? What's Sean? What's Jennifer? What what are they going to? How are they going to tell? That's right. This old story and rem, and keep the truth the truth, mm-hmm. but also how are they going to tell it? And what Malcolm Gladwell says is people have the room to listen. Yes. If it's compelling. Yes. So make it compelling. That's right. Mm. That's right. I didn't see the mystery came out of left field and I loved it. You're right. It's, <laughs> and and I love that. The I'm gonna leave with my nose. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, all right. Next up. What's trending? <laughs> is this our last podcast? I don't, I don't know what to do with that. <laughs> Whoa! Oh wow! Uh, okay, I didn't have. Um, I didn't have. That could have gone real left, real fast. It really could have. <laughs> Just like a little. I know it's trendy. Oh boy! Uh, okay. Oh boy! All oh, right. Boy. Uh, I had to do it. It was there. I'm about to go on paternity leave. You can send all of your complaint emails to DeAndre Uh-oh. Johnson at MDMC.org. <laughs> or to work it out at MDMC.org. You know we have that address. Have you ever checked That's it? That's right. We do. I, I have not. Me neither. Um, <laughs> going on to what's trending, uh, we've got a cool article uh, by mm-hmm. Reverend Lydia Son. She's a United Methodist minister who's actually about to come out with a book forthcoming um, called Here, A Spirituality of Staying in a culture of leaving. It's an op-ed from the New York Times, just kind of, I think, a little preview of this book coming out by her uh, in the new year. But um, we were drawn to it because of uh, <laughs> anything a United Methodist minister is putting out in the NY Times. We want to just kind of check it out. And it's a really interesting talk, um, yeah. talking about the value of work. And um, what did you pick up from it uh, in your reading, DeAndre? Well, I'm, I'm, uh, so I was drawn in. Uh, I mm-hmm. found compelling her opening deal about uh, her description of the early days of motherhood and yeah. how she found that there was pretty much an app or some kind of service to take care of every aspect of actual mothering. Yes. Right? Something to come and clean up, uh, pick up and clean and fold your laundry. Uh, somebody to come and put up the new furniture. Somebody uh, to help uh, train you on sleep training and with for your toddler and yep. all that jazz. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm sure you and Leslie have we do. already experienced some of this. Well, we, we have yes, so we have all those in place. What's the most we, outlandish service you, you've you've encountered so far? Okay, are you ready for this? Um, Come on. Well, there is a there is something called the SNU. Are you familiar with the SNU? No. S N O O. And the SNU is a um, a bedside um, bassinet mm-hmm. that. Um, finds early on when the baby is placed in what rhythm hmm. the baby likes and um, adjust based on if the baby starts crying to going back to the right rhythm whenever it kind of goes into different motions. So when it, huh. it notices when the baby's sleeping, <laughs> it notices when the baby's crying and it adjusts. That is, uh, we were gifted that, uh, basically this, this, fa- this fit, well, this family bought it and they've just been giving it to Different other people. families and just saying, Hey, we'll come back and get it whenever you're ready for it. <laughs> uh, church family, um, shout out, uh, to El- Bill and Eleanor for, uh, bringing it over to our house. And, um, it's going to be a gift. We haven't used it yet, obviously, but it looks very cool. Yeah. The second thing, one more thing is, dude, we have a formula mixer i've heard of these things that you just put the formula in and you control from an app what and it from an app from an app it's got wi-fi in it and you put in on your phone which formula it is and then it will mix to the right content so you're making formula cocktails for your baby is that well, what you're that's, doing that's right old fashions oh. basically <laughs> just <laughs> Old fashioned uh, <laughs> formula, you know, <laughs> a little orange peel on the end, isn't it? You can do that, right? It should be fine. 
Wow. A church member the other day was like, just put a little whiskey in the bottle. It'll be fine. I was like, I don't think that's, well, you were born in the 60s, bro. Uh, this is, uh, yeah. So it's it's wow. uh, over the top. And it's, it's incredible how even parents of younger kids who are two or three or four, new stuff comes out all the time. All the time. So they're like, what are you talking about? With a snoo. Yeah. Uh, and I was like, you have a four-year-old. They're like, I wasn't there when I was there. So, I mean, it's only, and then, you know, yeah. you've got older kids. So, it's, that's there's crazy. a lot of wild, yeah. Well, I mean, sorry, part, just no, no, no. I mean, there. no, I mean, that's, that's exactly the, the point, right? right? Uh, part of what she gets at is how um, there's so many opportunities to take, uh, in, in some of her words, to take the work out of living. Oh, yeah. Uh, and so part of what what she began to wonder is about this what she called this modern day obsession with efficiency mm. and if that efficiency actually comes at the cost of helping us to actually uh, understand and to participate in to what she also refers to as the sacred alchemy <laughs> of living <laughs> right yeah uh, and that is to say that um, there's something beautiful about the slow way of doing things the less efficient way of doing things that can lead towards deeper insights into one, who you are, but also whose you are. Yeah, there it is. She talks about that story about navigating whether to say yes to being a senior pastor at, yeah. at this church. And a professor friend of hers who also has a baby uh, was really encouraged her to keep doing and being that pastor. Um, and she said here, I find that being, a, and this is the professor speaking, I find that being a mom makes me a better professor. She said, the time away from work when I'm with kids, watching them at the playground or folding their laundry is where my brain synthesizes all the information I receive at work or come up with the ideas for writing my research. Mm -hmm. So like if she found an efficient way take care of that get a nanny you know right. uh, um find an app that takes care of it send you know for the, when the kids are young send the clothes off to the laundry service yeah yeah i mean it's it's that it's that sense to some degree that finding the efficiency to handle the routine mundane tasks of life yep could perhaps enable her to devote more time to focus in on the um uh, the problems or the issues or the challenges of work. Yep. But that actually falls a bit counter to what actually works well to help her work well. Yeah. Right. Uh, spot on. And, and and that's and that's part of what I mean we've we've seen some of this research and just general science in general is to say that, hey, oftentimes the best way to come up with the greatest idea for whatever you're facing yeah. is to go for a run. Go, yep. Go take a walk. Yep. Take your shower, yep. right? Go play with the kids, play with the dog, go play tennis, play pickleball, like go do something imaginative, creative, something that is completely different than the thing you're working on or your thing you're worried about. And oftentimes that gives the brain an opportunity to begin to synthesize things in a way that then you can begin to see new possibilities. Um, I love how she moves that in here to talk about how not only does that work in terms of how we enter into a creative space yep. for better work and workflow, but then also for how we tune in better to deeper spirituality. Yeah. And here she, she makes, um, she refers to the Benedictine, um, practice of work and prayer. Yeah. Right. That we pray as we work. Uh, and so in the Benedictine practice, it intentionally moves slowly, mm -hmm. intentionally moves slowly in very mundane domestic, uh, kind of activities for the sake of engaging prayer. Yeah. And I just wonder how many times, uh, and Michael, this will be a, this will be a challenge for you. Come on, preacher. Is how many times, um, how many times can you pray while changing diapers? Mm. And 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 how might that engage a deeper spirituality? Moments. Oh, that reminds me. Do you have the book Every Moment Holy? 
Yes, I do. Yeah, yeah. What I love in uh, this is a series of uh, books. Yeah. Um, I got the first and second edition. Yeah, they're yeah. Big, big books. Yeah, that's right. They're called Every Moment Holy and uh, written in part by Andrew Peterson, who's also a musician oh, and a worship that. leader, uh, as well as some others. And uh, in the book, it has several prayers, and many of the prayers are for ordinary things oh, yeah. in life. Oh, yeah. And so there's a prayer. You should check it out. I think it's in the first edition. There's a prayer for changing diapers or a, a, lit- a liturgy for changing diapers. Yeah. Yeah. I liked how some churches during uh, COVID would have like a little hymn that you could sing while you washed your hands. Yes. You know, just like, I mean, the mundane of... You, this this thing that's going to save you in some capacity, washing your hands, being clean, sanitized, and yet also, yeah, there's this there's work in prayer. No, I, I'm I'm not trying to um, <laughs> Jesus juke. You ask me if I'm going to pray during diapers. I I, I have I am um, I think, admittedly, a, a deep a fear is just um, is the mundane. Sure, that comes with this new. I do mundane things all the time, but this is mon- like helping another person, another child. I mean, the mundane of eating and going to the bathroom and mm-hmm. sleeping. Yeah. Those mundane tasks that we think and like, I hope it, I know it will be. Everyone's like, it's going to change you. Duh. But just like, I hope I'm, I hope I'm changed and transformed in the most mysterious, spring in that mysterious way, mm. mysterious ways. Yeah. I think I will be. And it's even through the mundane of the diaper and, Folding clothes and that's right. Baths and yeah, it's well, cool. You know, I remember a time when my son was, I think he was in second grade at mm-hmm. this time, mm-hmm. and um, he he honestly was just being a little snoot that day. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I was picking he and his sister up from school yep. um, uh, after school. I picked them up, and you had to pick them up from this one place, and then we walked to the uh, to the car where I parked. And he was he was complaining about every little thing. And yeah. he, he was moving really slow and I had things to do, right? And I was so annoyed by him. Okay. And finally he was asking me something over and over again. And finally I, I turned and I yelled at him. This is this is your pastor at his best moment. <laughs> uh, I turned and I yelled at him and I said, If you don't get in this car right now, right? And he just burst into tears. Oh. And then I immediately felt bad. Sure. Um, and so on the drive home uh, first, I was I was all at once mad and feeling bad for having uh, yelled at him and yeah. made him cry. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Also feeling a bit embarrassed because there are all these other parents uh, with their kids. It's like, oh, that's so great, Johnny. Oh, that's so great, or whatnot. And here I am yelling at my kid, <laughs> making him cry yep. in the middle of the parking lot. Right. So anyway, <laughs> um, driving home then um, with him in the back seat. He's, sniffling and whatnot i'm feeling bad but also still mad yeah. and justified in my anger yeah. and all that. oh yeah and and then i started wondering how can i give thanks to god for for the exuberance my son is trying to show to me today right and and then all of a sudden it's like maybe maybe the problem is is that i need to reframe mm. what is needed and necessary right now mm. And, and I wonder if part of what uh, Reverend Son tries to get at here, we're talking about how we, uh, uh, we pray as we work, as yeah. we do the mundane, as we do some of the slow things, et cetera, uh, is, to, is to invite the Spirit to help us reframe every moment. Yeah. That every moment, no matter how mundane it is, how annoying it is, how frustrating it could be, and so every moment can be imbued with some grace mm. Even the moments where we make incredible mistakes yeah. that we feel bad for, yeah. um, that it also holds some grace for us. Hmm. Man. You brought the spirit in there at the very end. <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm still in awe about those. Um, so a little inside. DeAndre asked a question about the Holy Spirit to our men's life. A bunch hmm. of, you know, 30, 40, 50 year old dudes who most of them work in oil and gas. Most of them do accounting. Most of them are in some, you know, unique field out there, you know, just memorial dads. Their answers about the Holy spirit were beautiful. Yes. You're asked, what does it mean to be filled by the Holy spirit? And I think you you speak to that. It's like, is once someone said like the spirit is a guide is a, is a, you know, my, my North star, my compass. And if that's your compass, you can, 
You can find that North Star wherever you look. Everywhere. Everywhere. Yeah. yeah. So finding God in the mundane and doing mundane acts and being grateful. Mm-hmm. Ah, so good. I'm ready for this book. I know, right? It's, it's, it's uh, very compelling. Here, a spirituality of staying in a culture of leaving. Yeah. Oh, the title's good. Yeah. It's good. All right, friends. Well, we've come to the end. We've got one last part as we always close with a little theological thought. Theological mm. thought. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> I should have let you have that one because I really creeped out people on the last one. And here's a theological thought is... Um, speaking of... Speaking no. of... Um, we are in the middle of a sermon series right now at MDMC called Be Kind. Be Just. Be Just, Be Kind, Be Humble. Yeah. I am. Let's get that in order. So Be Just, Be Kind, Be Humble. Any of you, does that ring a bell? Yeah, it should. It's Micah 6, 8, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, that scripture. And we have, I haven't done this in a while, but for four weeks sat in that scripture and it's yeah. a and we've passed out um you know uh yard signs, yard signs yeah but people wearing buttons just a little a little um nod to the political season sure but also a mindfulness that there's a different way and we've i think this there's been a trend in this conversation about our attention where we put our effort finding the spirit all around us mm-hmm. and this week we're preaching on um kind of Micah's second petition, which is um, loving kindness, yeah. hesed, right? Yeah. And uh, as I'm prepping for that sermon, um, a little poem by Langston Hughes. You got some, you know Langston Hughes? I don't know him. <laughs> <laughs> you know all the Brother Hughes? I'm, I'm familiar yeah, with yeah, who yeah. Langston Hughes Langston is. Hughes, a great poet. Uh, he, uh, he um, I was just referring this to, DeAndre earlier because as, as um, he wrote a poem called Tired and uh, Dikembe Mutombo, the great basketball player, Atlanta Falcon, uh, not Atlanta Falcon, Atlanta Hawk, and also a little Houston uh, Rocket for some time, recently passed away. And his son quoted this Langston Hughes poem called Tired. Mm. And uh, the, the words say this by Langston Hughes. I am so tired of waiting. Aren't you? For the world to become good and beautiful and kind. Let us take a knife and cut the world in two and see what worms are eating at the rind. (laughs) The optimist seven in me wants there to be some resolve. Yeah. Yeah. And there isn't. No. No, there isn't. There isn't. I, I want. I want there to be, and so now be kind. <laughs> but there isn't. Mm-mm. It is. See what worms are eating at the rind. So go here. here well, here. Here's what. Um, <laughs> what I. What it makes me want to ponder uh, and spend more time thinking through, is two things. That question at the beginning, uh, I'm so tired, aren't you, of waiting, right, suggests that um, there is something worth waiting for. Mm. Um, and, uh, and, and like the second half suggests, uh, gives the, the image of some kind of fruit that is to be ripened. Mm-hmm. Right, um, uh, rind. I immediately think of like a melon type of yeah. fruit, right? Um, some kind of fruit that is to be ripened, and you gotta wait for those things to ripen. Yep. Um, and that ripe, that ripenedness here, of to become good and beautiful and kind. There's a waiting there, and to believe, to believe beyond belief, there is something worth waiting for. Hmm. Um, that's what I want to be ponder. There's really something worth waiting for. Uh, we can be tired. And yeah, I get tired. I'm sure you get tired. Everybody gets tired, but there's something worth waiting for. So he doesn't say, uh, let's stop waiting. But he does suggest that if there's something here that is going to interrupt that ripening process, hmm. 
Let's figure out how to get rid of it. Mm. But it does involve a cutting open. Yeah. It does involve surveying what's at the core. Mm-hmm. A breaking of sorts. A breaking. A breaking. And um, the challenge, to, I mean, the, the invitation for us to do the breaking. Hmm. Yeah. Rather than, and sometimes breaking happens for us. Yeah. Things happen. People fall apart. Situations explode. But in order to find this beauty and this love and this kindness, there has to be a bit of a breaking mm. to look from within. Mm. And there isn't really a resolve with the worms. You know, mm -mm. it's like, uh, I wonder what the worms are eating at the rind. So what's there? What's What are the worms eating at? Mm. Yeah. Are they eating at? Um, everything that isn't good, beautiful, and kind? Or are they eating at the roots of what could be good, oh, beautiful, and kind? Dang it. All right, we got to wrap this up. <laughs> you monster. Well, I'll say this last thing to ponder, right? Come on. It is. It, it, it perhaps is a significant choice that uh, though the poem starts with I, the rest of it, has everything to do with us. Uh, I didn't notice that until now. Man. This it's, is good. This is deep. It's full circle, isn't it? Full, oh, full circle. Uh, we, uh, <laughs> weemba way, weemba way. Oh. <laughs> Circle of life. On the day we arrived oh on the planet. What have we done? <laughs> that was such a beautiful moment <laughs> that we both just, you know, whispered into this microphone again and just <laughs> we'll let it ride. We we have to, friends. If if we, uh, it, it's good to to dance in the beauty and the laughter of it all because mm. man, this is a this is really a powerful poem. The more you let it sit. You will probably listen to this after Sunday, um, October, whatever it is, 20th, because um, it'll come out next week. But there might be a little talking about this in a sermon on Sunday because there's a lot of good from it. Mm -hmm. And um, I think the point of the son talking about this was that Dikembe Mutombo, his father, did the work in humanitarian efforts in Africa, especially where he's from, to to tear apart what needs to be to see what's down below and to, yeah. and to find the beauty and love and kindness all around us. And might we do the same? And again, emphasis on the we. We're in this together. That's right. Hmm. Yeah. All right, man. Well, hey, dude, I'm about to be a dad. Yeah, dude. <laughs> Here we go. Look at you. All right. Oh. Any, any last words of wisdom? Give me one line. Here it is. This is the penultimate. I need this before we go. No pressure, but this is what I'm going into the hospital with. Ready, set. Everything happens one day at a time. Oh. Are you sure? I'm quite positive. <laughs> one day at a time, sir. One Deal. day at a time. Deal. Don't borrow tomorrow's troubles. Oh. Quote. Quoting Bible at me. Ah, it's Just good. one day at a one time. One day at a time. Yeah. Maybe so there. Amen. Well, okay, friends. Thanks again for tuning in. We look forward to seeing you back in December, but hope you uh, love the episode. Share it with your friends. And I'm Michael Jarbo. I'm DeAndre Johnson. And thank you for working it out with us. Peace. Peace.